Yeah, so we got to, oh, yeah. Oh, yes, you got to do that. Do it, grab a piece of paper, we'll do it real quick. Got a minute. You want to do it now or do it at lunch? Do it at lunch, then pop in real quick. It takes no more, it'll take you no more than two minutes. It took you, yeah, it took you about two minutes. Yeah, I mean, if you can do that organization, that's great. Oh, uh, we got, so we got, uh, oh, what was the strategy the Republicans in 1952 used against the Democrats to say they might have been? Well, red baiting was calling them communists. What was the strategy to say? <laughs> no, let me finish the question. That made them feel vulnerable to Soviet atomic attack. The bomber gap. Huh? And the bomber gap, what was the bomber gap then? That was big planes. Big planes. Yeah. Was there a bomber gap? No. Yes. Yes. But well, yeah. That. Yeah, the other way around. The other way around. Who was the Democratic, the Democrat who ran against Eisenhower? And who was the Republicans? Who was the vice president? Nixon. Yeah, that was Richard Nixon. And so we got the uh, Korean War. Oh, the United States and Allied forces would fight under whose flag? Whose flag overall? Who? U.S., South Korea, all the other out would fight. Yeah, the U.N. flag, the United Nations. And why was the Soviet Union boycotting the Security Council when the war began? Yeah, because China. That's what we're pretty sure, even though Stalin did aid North Korea, we knew. Uh, we knew that he probably was surprised by the attack just as much as the Americans were. Who entered the war in November of 40? China, a massive ground war, bloody fight. And so Eisenhower got elected. We got stalemate armistice. So we got preserved the New Deal. Did we get the Federal Aid Highway Act? No. So, so that's the interstate highway system. Some things you see it written as the National Defense Highway System. By the way, that Roosevelt, or I'm sorry, that Eisenhower sold it to his own party was by saying we need interstate highways to evacuate cities in case of nuclear war. So that would be part of the deal with interstate highways. It's going to copy the Autobahn. It's going to be built over the next uh, almost 50 years. And so the two interstates of Montana, uh, three interstates, I'm sorry, we have I-15, I-90, and I-94 right here. And they were finished in the 80s and into the 90s, 1980s, 1990s. So when I was a kid growing up in Billings, I remember driving from Miles City, going up from Miles City, I'm sorry, going to the big city of Billings. Have you been to Billings? It's a big city. It's scary. We go to four lane, then the two, then the four, then the two. Now it's all four. And this was a big jobs program, but also a big program to help aid business. Think about a business, you can move, um, move products around. We became probably too dependent on highways and, let our, and the railroads are kind of going to garbage. But also, this is a big jobs program to make it. You'll notice that they're constantly working on the highways, constantly. And that's part of the plan. They built the highways with the idea that they have to be repaired every couple of years. So you're constantly having to pump money into the economy, hire workers, et cetera. Yeah. Um, why would this from railroads, what banking were they? No, what it meant is that because the we, we spent so much more money investing in the highways and not investing in railroads, we transport goods and became more dependent on truck transport. And the railroads went away from transporting goods to just trying to basically have all one uh, a train with one uh, one product on. It. The railroads would be more oh significantly more. Yeah, railroads. It costs energy efficiency about one fifteen. No budget, but we spend a lot more. That's part of the reason why we have a little bit higher food prices than, let's say, Germany. Yeah. So, uh, so does that, so I'm going to assume that this falls under the government, not the Department of Transport. Does it hire its own labor, or does it outsource its own contractors? Most of it to contractors, but they do have some of their own laborers. And a lot of what they do is they give money to states, to, the states to do it too. And the money I should add comes from gas tax, most of the money. 
you pay about 50 cents a gallon for gas on tax, and that goes paid for the gas. Montana benefits a lot from this because we really don't have many people. I don't know if you know that. Montana is huge. Not many people live here. So we benefit from tax, gas taxes from people who drive in, let's say, New York City. We get a lot more than we put in as a state. We have a lot of roads and not a lot of people. Oh, and then they expanded Social Security. And so it went to self-employed people. So self-employed people, Social, Social Security, uh, let me backtrack, Social Security was paid for by payroll tax and then it was matched by the employer. They added in the 1950s, if you're self-employed or a farmer, I guess it would be the same, same thing. They pay both that tax. And so, for example, I pay 6.2%. The school district pays 6.2% for my Social Security. If I was self-employed, I would pay the full 12.4% tax. But then get old age pension. All of you, if you worked for a job with a W-2, you're paid into Social Security. So you have a work record. And you have to have a work record to get it. So if you are, you're already started, if you paid, you have paid in income. All right. There are other things too, but the, for the most part, conservative Republicans were furious at Eisenhower. In fact, a lot of Republicans started calling Eisenhower a communist sympathizer, which to me is just so fascinating. But, but then again, his own party calling him a communist by the end of his term. Uh, it just shows you how crazy that just throwing out that kind of stuff all the time. So, then a few more things we have to get here. So what we have here is developing a consumer economy. Yes. So the 1950s, we had this in the 20s. We talked about it then, the shift to the consumer economy. This is what really began, the consumer economy. And part of the problem was because of economies of scale, remember that, economies of scale produce more. Companies by the 1950s were producing much more than what people could buy. It was a real issue. We especially noticed in cars. Cars can last a long time, but they needed people to buy cars constantly over the matter of TVs or whatever it might be. And so in the 1950s, and we see it to this very day, to keep this perpetual growth that is necessary in a capitalist economy, you got to keep selling stuff and buying stuff and producing more and more and more, which are going to have some problems down the road. But how do you encourage demand? What's well, no coincidence that this will be the second golden age of advertising. Right after World War II, or World, World War I was the first golden age. And it's no coincidence. You take the guys who sold the war, and they have them now selling toothpicks. Remember, who was the first candidate who did a large series of ads? Ike. We'll come back to I Like Ike. I'm about to hear that again. I know you missed that song already, right? Right? There we go. Okay. And what is advertising? Well, advertising, I mean, they have to try to market a product and convince people. In fact, this is advertising. This is the definition. You want to get this down? The fine art of convincing somebody to buy something they don't need. That's advertising. To convince people to buy something they don't need. A better way to look at it might be to convince people they need something they never needed before. They need this. And it doesn't mean they're bad things or good things. It's not even a value judgment, but people made it perfectly fine without TVs. Now they needed them. All of you were perfectly fine, and people before you were perfectly fine without a phone to have all the time. And now, like you, you kind of have a society now where you need You don't necessarily, but you kind of do. And it's quite effective to give that idea that I'm missing out if I don't have it. And the best, best way they do it, a great example, was marketing the new model year. So here's Christ, they're talking about the new 56s. And model year for cars aren't as big a deal as they used to be, but we see this in other products. I mean, whenever a new Apple phone comes out, what are they on now, Apple 506 or 78 or, you know, whatever, they come up with some, they, they, they make no real change to the phone, but they market and people are gotta go out and buy it. They make cosmetic changes to cars, and this, this used to be such a big deal. I should add, this is the era of tail fins, and this is the, uh, the this, yeah, these are, um, these are plums and Chrysler, but uh, the tail fins, so it looks like a jet fire. That's why they did that. 
and soon they're going to have bigger and bigger tail fins. The, the 1959 Cadillac had a two foot eye tail. They're showing the people impaling themselves as they're riding their bike and hit the tail. I don't know if that's made up or not, but it, it could be true. I mean, it's the saber too. That's a saber fighter. Hmm? It is a one. That, they're showing it next to a, a F-86 Sabre fire. <laughs> they should. But, huh? The tail? I know! I know, not everything has these big, ugly grills, and I hate the new. I hate new vehicles and big boxes staging like it. I'm not a fan. But, tail fins, yeah. And steel dashboards and steel steering wheels. That was the day. You got in a car wreck and boom, you're in hell. That's, you were top. Well, let's get to the next big thing. This actually fits into the new model year. Something that is so effective to get people to buy and buy and buy. It's called planned obsolescence. Where they purposely make goods with the idea that soon they will be either old, not usable anymore. So what do you have to do? Buy a new one. And so you basically have this whole disposable culture where you constantly need new ones. And so just minor little changes, but you make sure that eventually they got to get a new one, either convince them they need them or that they don't work anymore. And you know that's where technology is such a good, good example of that. They're constantly getting you to buy new ones, new phone, new app, whatever it might be, new programs and computer. And then engineer it. So eventually the ones you were using become obsolete. Yeah. Is there like, is that where the development is? Oh, exactly. We're just coming back. It's this whole disposable culture there. The idea of a disposable you know, plastic silverware was seen at, would have been like insane in the 20s. They began to be marketed in the 1950s with the new plastics developed during World War II. And yeah, and this whole idea of everything's disposable. And you know, all the disposable packaging. Yeah, nice. You know, no one has a plastic bottle. They're drinking water. But can you think of anything more just disposable, throw away? I do it. We all do it. That's the society we live in. But it's just thrown away. And they now market and make like television sets. There's no expectation that you would repair them. They don't work anymore. You throw them away. And before you, know, they were really expensive. You want to get them repaired. You see, that's with so many things. This disposable world. But why did they do that? To keep demand up. To keep demand up and you buying stuff. And so I love when they started coming to the flat screens. This is a dump of all the TV sets from the late 1990s just being thrown away. And the school district spent a lot of money to put TVs in every single classroom. They were hanging. My TV was hanging right there in the early 2000s. And three years later, they all came in one summer, took them all down, and all disappeared. Came in and took them. That's disposable. And that's why they do that. So it gives a feeling that the economy is doing well, but you have this um, throwaway and accumulation of stuff. And what we have developing is a new American. Now, when I mean a new American dream, this is now with that new middle class. Remember the Great Compression? That Great Compression, the gap between the rich and the poor shrunk between the New Deal and the, and the late 1970s? More and more people had more and more affluence or wealth than ever before. The old American dream, do you remember Thomas Jefferson and that idea of agrarian lifestyle and never go to have their own little farm? That was the American dream that kind of blew up in the 20s and 30s. Even though it still exists, how many wealthy people want to go get their little farm? How many of them come to Montana and buy a ranch? Very, very wealthy people. Much more than I realized. But, but, but for the most part, that's not for most people aren't going to have that. So this new American dream, and I thought this, I just thought this picture was kind of funny. And also, it involves lard. Let's be clear about it. There's going to be lard in this new America. I don't know what that is with the American dream. I just thought that commercial was so funny. They're happy because they eat lard. <laughs> Who has this envision of them sitting there with a bowl of lard and a spoon? <laughs> Maybe a little chocolate. Okay. It involved three basic elements in this new American dream. A home, a car, own your own home. 
which was almost an impossible dream for most Americans in the 30s and 40s. A car becoming more mature by the 20s, and then all those new electronic gizmos. Remember, I talked about radios in the 20s, but now it's TV. But it's also washer and dryer. An electric stove. Wow. A refrigerator freezer. You know, those elements too, but I'm just represented it all by the television became. The television became so big and so dominant in the 1950s, it's hard to even wrap your mind around it. From virtually no television at the beginning of the decade. So nationwide television, three major networks that virtually every household have. NBC and CBS were radio networks, they went to TV, and ABC was created um, out of a couple of small little networks as a, as a competitor. And oh, one more thing I did not type down, I don't know why, but also a better life for their children, a better life. With this idea of the middle class growing, it became more and more conceivable that our children, you know, if you have children, they're going to have a better life than you. It just seems like it's, everything was just getting better. You know, the, the top 30s and 40s and the 50s seem so much better. In the 60s, there are elements that were disruptive, but the economy was booming. And so they're just feeling just constantly going to get better. And there's only one reason why. We all know it, right? We all know it. Lard. Thank you, lard. I don't think I've ever said that before. <laughs> but I'm never going to quit. Okay. So with this, it's no coincidence with this optimistic view of the 19 of the 1950s and 60s. There'll be a baby boom. Now, people, they, there's this obsession with generations, and baby boom generation, and what is it, generation X or something, and then millennials and Gen Z and Gen Y and Gen Q, and, and then the C. What? The next generation. And they just kind of make up to me that's very arbitrary and it's not so. I mean, they have the baby food generation from 45 to 65. You're trying to tell me there's a big difference between somebody born in 1964 and someone born in 1966. I mean, the whole generation thing is so. But the reason we have to talk about this is because it was such a massive increase in the birth rate. You might know it's a little one in World War II. There was almost a desperation during wartime. To get married, the birth rate was tanked in the Great Depression. I think you understand why. But in World War II, there was like, well, we might not have it tomorrow. Especially with mostly men going away. It'd be like, this, they meet, men and women would meet and get married and have still. I know that seems insane, but think about it. But then after the war, and this all comes from an add that one thing. Have this. Hope. They had great hope for the future. They have a lot of hope. And it seemed to be being fulfilled. Life will be better. If you have hope for the future, you plan differently today. You make investments for the future if you think tomorrow will be better. If you think tomorrow will be worse, don't you act totally different? Why say? Why prepare? I mean, there's a big difference. You, know, you, you can see, you just go into like big cities and areas that have hope. You know, that tomorrow will be better than they have clean, well-manicured yards, because we're playing for the future. There's a lack of hope, why try? It's, it's really noticeable in some areas. Hope is a big deal. Oh, and I thought this picture was great. So you have this massive increase in this generation. Oh, I should add, so don't forget, you haven't talked about the 1960s and the baby boomers. They were just teenagers, the, the first ones. The 60s was really this, this generation. It's the 70s. Yeah, and that, so I blame them for disco and the lives of contributors. I'm just telling you. I mean, but so germ theory relatively new, hospitals becoming more important. And the thought was okay, we have to, the babies when they're first born are the most vulnerable. So they would put these in the, these baby rooms where they would be sterile. And so right after children were born, I mean, literally after they were born, they were taken away from their mother and isolated in these rooms with other babies. And so they would go look at their baby through a window. They wouldn't, for a week, they didn't want you to touch your baby because they thought you might spread the germs. It's like crucial development. What is it, what's that? It's like crucial development in between the mother and the child. 
No, no, you want them isolated. So what, it, what is it now? What do they do? I mean, like immediately. I just found that, you know, they're, I just found that kind of amusing. So, so have sympathy for people born in this era. Yeah, yeah. And in some places, you start you start seeing that going away in the '80s, and it's really controversial. The idea of the mother and the child should be put together. Mother and baby. Yeah, that's pretty hilarious. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it's weird that that would seem controversial today. <laughs> I, I was born in a in a little tiny hospital in Montana, so there was no baby. You <laughs> barely. <laughs> I was actually for six months. My first six years, they just never let me see them. And then all of a sudden, wow! Hey, there's no photographic evidence of my child, so I don't know. All right, so with that. There's also a big population shift. Farming and so-called rural population went down. Now this chart is from the early, this came from a book of, uh, at the turn of the century. It has the rural population going up, but they counted suburbs as rural. Helena's rural. No, I know if we compare Helena, let's say New York City, it's not, you know, Aunt Helena's rural. But let's say we compare it to Townsend. You know, there's a big difference. And so let's not worry so much about this number. Let's worry about I'm not worried. Look at this. There were still over 30 million farmers all the way through the Great Depression. By 1990, less than 4 million. And it's half of that now. There's almost no full time farming in the United States at all. Even in a so called agricultural state like Montana, there's virtually no full time farmers. And so this is a big shift that's happened. And part of this is going to be migration to the Sun Belt. And the Sun Belt or Southern states can't understate the value of air conditioning, of course. But also, a lot of companies begin moving north because South is anti union. Anti union because landlords own, they hated the idea of unions because it raises wages, but also because a lot of people, it was harder to start unions because of the racial animosity. And it really started with the textile industry moving south. We start seeing car parts companies begin to move south more and more. Yeah. They move south because it's not me. Did I say they move north? Yeah. Oh, I'm really sorry. Will you forgive me? No. Wow. Yeah. I'm sorry. I meant they moved south. And so the reason why you know, the textile industry didn't pay much in Massachusetts, but they paid half as much in North Carolina. And then in the 1990s or early 2000s, they all moved to Guatemala or Vietnam, where they could pay one tenth or one twenty. And yes, without repercussions down the road, but this is kind of amazing. In the 1950s, the population in Arizona went up 73 percent. Nevada, 78. Now, no, but not a lot of people live there. But once you start having air conditioning and a few other things, you see the population grow. California, 50%. Texas, 25%. But now Texas is booming. Part of the reason is because real estate is cheaper. A lot cheaper than California. Which is kind of weird to think about. We start seeing this grow too. California had their big boom, 78% air conditioning. All air conditioning. But one more thing too. In the Southwest, this is going to lead to the first of the big water crisis. And remember, I told you about the New Deal and the WPA made all the dams. Well, in the 1950s, there was a massive uh, uh, dam building water conservation program here, huge, where they made even more dams on the Colorado River, dammed up everything. And this is becoming a crisis that's not strong enough to return. And so we see it starting in the 50s, but right now the Colorado River is about to and nobody has any idea. Nobody's willing to do it. And so it's going to be a crisis down the road. You see, it didn't really start to the 50s. It really also goes to show you that's really not that long ago. It didn't take long. Okay, with that, also a growth of suburbia. There was a massive housing shortage, unprecedented housing shortage. Okay, today is kind of comparable, but for different reasons. 
but no one's making houses in the Great Depression and World War II. There's no building materials. So you have all these people after the war who had relatively good paying jobs but couldn't spend the money or took advantage of the post-war affluence by the 1948-1949. They wanted home. And you have all these new married couples starting to have children and they're living with their parents crammed into apartments in big cities, let's say, or paying extraordinarily high rent in town. And so the stage was set for all this farmland outside the cities to be bought up relatively cheap and build homes as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Bill Levitt would be kind of considered the father of this. Now, he did not invent this. They were doing some elements of this in the 1920s. But he was so successful at marketing one of the first of these new suburban towns called Levittown, where he basically had one model for a house with a few, with two other cosmetic differences. And they would build, uh, oh, and add this, they would take assembly line processes and take them to build a home. And so they had the crew to make the foundation. They would go bang, 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 and build these. We were talking, um, anywhere from five to 10 houses a day. All the materials prefabricated, and you have the framers coming, boom, put the frame, boom, the siding, boom, the roof, the, shield, the shinglers would come in while the carpenters were inside. You know, the plumber was a big mob of them go to door to door, and boom, you have a house. And there's soon to be level town too, and all kinds of imitations. They're relatively small, they all basically look the same. And if you go to one of these neighborhoods, especially one, I mean, they're still kind of like that, but now there's more cosmetic differences that make them look a little bit different. We still see basic similarities. In Helena, you see that, but go well, here, every house is the same. And you know, think about these big open fields before there were trees. I mean, they look pretty bare. And some people kind of resisted this, but you didn't have a home, and now you probably have your own home away from your parents, so you're not a burden on them. Living your own life, this was a big deal, owning this, and you could pay for it. And I should add, look at the way they designed it. This could never have happened. This is so crucial to suburbia. Yeah. They go hand in hand. The new building of roads, cars, cheap gasoline, suburbia, all go together. And look at the way they designed this. Efficient city blocks, if you have a lot of walking people, people walk, are small, square, and gray. Because you've got to turn a lot, you're walking. You go east or west of the, of the capital, Mellon. That's a neighborhood that was designed in the, in the teens of the 20th century. It's a small grid because everybody was walking. This, look at sunny capitals in this. You know some streets kind of wind like this? That's the sign of cars. No one's walking into cars. So you see those bigger blocks, windy roads, that's what cars. Yeah. So they give them the idea of more space. They can get some bigger blocks and smaller blocks. So if you make that bend, you get bigger blocks on one side, smaller blocks on the other side, you can sell them for more. Yeah, so that's it. So if you're flying a plane, look over the suburbs, you see those roads, that's why it looks like it's all for cars. So for example, Los Angeles had, in the late 1940s had the best mass transit system in the world. Light rail, follow everywhere, everywhere, it's fantastic. So you have to go to the suburbs, General Motors and Standard Oil bought up the, the uh, it's called the red line, ripped it out. So they make highways and all dependent on cars. And it really made traffic great in Los Angeles. In the Los Angeles situation. Am I being sarcastic? Very. Los Angeles is a nightmare to drive in. Unless you really like traffic jams. Who likes traffic jams? I've been there. Has anyone else? I mean, yeah, it's it's just it's hard to get around. It's easy. Yeah, if, if you're where you want to be, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. 
Okay, and remember, the mortgage with the, uh, the Federal Home Administration and the VA through the GI Bill provided help with loans through mortgage insurance. And so this allowed all the veterans and people to buy these homes. Here's an advertisement for Levittown in the early 1950s. Look at the price for a house. There's been a lot of inflation, but still, 100 bucks down, you can buy a house. And with the FHA, people can start getting 30 year loans, so more people than ever before could afford a home. This is a big deal. By the way, the three, the Mariners, my opinion. Isn't that a lot better than the Snug Harbor? Uh, one's called the Mariner. <laughs> There's a slight difference, but yeah, actually, no, they all have the same. <laughs> they just don't draw it as much. One thing you'll notice, it's not late 1950s. Late 1950s, they started putting picture windows. Have you seen a home, home with a big picture window? And that was purely because of the influence of TV. <laughs> the idea you could sit in your living room and look outside of your window like a television. Yeah. You're looking through the pictures. Yeah. And so my house, my house was built. My house is one of the few built in the 1930s. It's kind of one of like the less than a dozen. Built in 1936. One of those sports. That's my house. No, I did not remember myself. <laughs> yeah. uh, this bigger. But we put new windows in in the summer, and we have a big picture window. And you, when they took out the window, I looked, and you could see the area where they cut and part where the old window is, because then they put that picture window up like everybody else did in the 1950s, like TV. I, I like the window. I like being able to look out there, but that's why they're there. And one thing about this is, though, well, when they started doing this, you might remember, these suburbs were white only. They did not, the FHA did not help them get loans, very few loans to people who were not white. And most of these home, most of these suburban, uh, suburban homes have have building covenants. Here's one of them for the Blue Ridge homes in, in um, Long Island. And the covenant is racial restrictions. Only white or Caucasians will be sold homes. And that was right there written in the covenants. I should add in the weird, uh, how weird the laws are, those covenants still exist. Still exist. And so, hmm? yeah. Or no one talks about them following. They follow it but don't advertise it. And so remember though, these are these kind of you know has a legacy of sundown towns. And just to review, remember I told you about this before, that's what redlining was. Remember redlining? Where they would um, cut off areas they would not give mortgage insurance for. And one of the things they would um, terrify the suburban owners are home values would drop if you allow anybody who's not white in. And so this is an article from Chicago, the Saturday Evening Post, but it's Chicago. And would you can't even dig will move next door. I know that very awkward term, but this is 1968. The idea being that if somebody who uh, was not white would move into a neighborhood, property values would drop. In fact, real estate, um, Real estate agents would go in the neighborhood and say, I understand some, I understand a black family is moving in. You better sell now. I'll give you half of what the home's worth. And they really did that. They had a whole scheme set up. It was kind of awful, but these are mostly large cities. And the red lining would go on. So basically, white only until the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1968. Lyndon Johnson's last big Civil Rights Act. And that was only partially successful. At the end of Martin Luther King's life, that was, he was one of the elements he was pushing for that in April, four people. Um, let's see, April, he went to support a garbage worker strike in Memphis, Tennessee, and that's where he'd be assassinated. We'll get to that very soon. And that's Chicago. I should add that the highest crime rates in Chicago today are the same areas that were red lines. It's almost like you put the same map. It's kind of weird. The other map, put that, and then the highest state of lead poison 
amongst kids is also in those areas. It's kind of like, wow, I don't know what to say. Okay, so you can really see it here. The red line just shows the growth of suburbs in the 60s. What happened to the cities, though? In the cities, they started calling it urban blight by the 1960s. And the term was literally white flight. They had a term for it. As white people began to move away to cities and these suburbs, and then it almost turned to a panic because the cities started to climb. If people with money leave the cities, their tax base drops. And their tax base drops, they can't clean up the city. The garbage collection goes down. They, the schools decline. And soon cities begin to grow bankrupt, but they started calling the cities ghettos, the poor areas of cities. This is Brooklyn in 1969. Because all the wealth went, they couldn't plant the city. New York went bankrupt twice because of the tax rate, the tax base left it. It even hit towns like Helena, where the downtown just literally just fell apart in the 1960s. So much of what you see in Helena now. Um, the good and bad parts about downtown were ripped up in the 1960s, 1970s, what's called urban renewal. That's why you have that weird parking garage in the middle of downtown, right on the walking malls. Like, why did they build that? It's part of this element. And so with that, let's get to the family zone. <laughs> Remember the COVID dome system. And don't forget, this goes back to the Industrial Revolution. And what happened is everybody who had this big desire for normalcy to go back to the way it was after the Depression, the GD, and World War II, the Great Depression, World War II. And so all these men and women after the war were desperate to like go back to the traditional family. And now we'll start over again and go back to the way at least we kind of imagined it was before the Depression and war. And so did I tell you about my grandma? We got pink slip right after the war. I didn't tell you that. So my, she won the war. Yes, yeah, so my grandma won the war. Well, she made, she was a supervisor making B-29 bombers, uh, along with many other people. I'll acknowledge that. At South of Omaha, Nebraska. And she was a supervisor. She had a lot of workers underneath her, men and women. When the war ended, so September 15th, I'm sorry, August 15th, 1945. And she remembers it well because they stayed up celebrating all night. So she hadn't slept. You know, they're just so happy the war was over. And they all came in and they lined up the workers and all the women on one side and all the men on the other side. And every single woman got a pink slip, including her. And the men, men that she was their supervisor, kept their job. Kept their job. Go back to normal. What's called the domesticity? What are women supposed to be? Yeah, housewife. She said she was happy after this. It made her feel good, like we're going to go back to normal. But there'd always be something in the back of her mind. Remembering this. It was, it, it was one of those, like, yes, we're going to go back to normal. I'm going to go back home. You know, my, my mom was a little girl. And go back home. And yeah, that she really regretted that. And so you're going to start getting these people, you, um, this, you know, starting families, getting married. In fact, that became the thing, get married. You're going to see, especially for women, the age they got married dropped dramatically. During the Depression, you can imagine a lot of people got married later and later because of insecurities. Especially when they started getting, getting married in their teens. Even high school age, a lot by the 1950s, was that because that's what we were supposed to do. In fact, that was the thing. You know, college was a place for women to go find a husband. That was your job to go find a husband. And so here was the idealized life then. Like it's a suburban, suburbia, isn't it? He's going off to the job and the world. She stays home with the children. She is his helpmate, the first mate, and the, he's the captain of the ship of the home. She's caring for the children. This is right. Um, this is actually right before DJ again. But they're already marketing the new woman to go back home. The new woman. But here's the thing. If you wanted to do anything else and were a woman, you were considered weird. Odd. There's something wrong with you if you want to have a career outside of this. 
So what's going to happen is the only role for women in this cult of domestic, the only role to be a success was to be married, be a homemaker. That's it. And so, you know, schools, women taught, were taught how to do That was home economics. It was called. There's even a college degree of that. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. The point is, that's it. And if you wanted to do anything else, there was something wrong with you. And especially wanted to delay marriage. I mean, my mom told me about when she was in college and was like, there was a lot of pressure. Got to get married. Got to get married. Got to get married. Got to get married. Element for men, but for women especially, had to get married. So 17, 18 years old, women are getting married. Yes, this will cause some issues in marriage. Is getting too casual. It's going to happen. Oh, bro, yeah. Yeah, because that has nothing really to do with it. Massive offense, you just visit. Broker clean, whatever. But, yeah. Uh, he lives in Australia. Like, he had a place that all throughout high school, they made all the yeah, that still goes on in some schools here, and a lot, especially a lot of private schools, that goes on. But yeah, that's that's not I, I was like, and there's nothing wrong. With, I mean, probably should know some of those, all of us should. I, I I have some of those skills. I can make puns. <laughs> yeah. Women were teachers, but there was always like women were teachers, especially a lot of kids. Most in high school, it was most of the But it was still like women. That's not normal. Yeah, that, that was supposed to be like not normal. In fact, a lot of women up until the 1970s, women would be fired. Oh, okay. Yeah, that happened. Yeah, that happened. Yeah, that happened. They get fired if they were pregnant. And, and women, of course, women are still denied promotion today because of that. Oh, you're going to have babies, so you won't put yeah. <laughs> Even though uh, you're going to see a lot of, uh, like, um, women will be provided tranquilizers because they feel unsatisfied with this life. And yes, lobotomies would come to women who are just upset. We just snap, we just cut that nerve and everything. You're just happy. That's actually true. And so with that, and so they would advertise and take advantage of this. And horribly, this casual sexism was just the norm. And so here, it's trying to show, you know, so women have this role and they kind of like, oh, they're at home. And they, they can't go into the adventurous world out here. So here, sooner or later, your wife will drive home. That's reason for owning a Volkswagen, meaning it's a cheap, relatively expensive car because she can hold them. <laughs> and. This one is just shocking. The easy open ketchup bottle, even a woman. You know. This is very casual sex. And this is shocking. Yeah. And she's replaced the bowls. Oh, really? It says, like, you need a man can open it, and the man's in the exact same pose, and then you can switch it for, like, the man's leaning over, and the woman is. Thinking. Yeah, so he like takes all. I'm not saying that, but yeah. Yeah, she takes all of these like six ads and just switches the bowls. That that's kind of funny. See, it says if your husband ever finds out that you're not store testing for fresher coffee, meaning you're not buying better coffee, he will beat you. Okay, so with that, yeah, we have to find that. And here's the thing about this. Let's be very clear. These are supposed to be funny. They're supposed to be funny. And it's clearly just making fun of women. And this was that was part of the cult of Doma City. It's no coincidence that this would help trigger feminism in the 1960s. Betty Friedan would write The Feminine Mystique at the end of the 1950s. Fantastic book. She's a pretty amazing writer. She went and interviewed other college graduates who, like her, graduated from college, but then became homemakers. And she had a very good marriage, loved her children, loved her husband. But she started writing because she felt unfulfilled as a journalism and literature major. And the mystique was that women 
are this mysterious creature that only need one thing, to be a homemaker, to be married. And she said that's a lie, that women need more avenues for success. There's nothing wrong with being a homemaker or whatever, whoever decides. It's the point is if that is your only avenue for success, your only choice. And it certainly doesn't mean you're a failure if you become a homemaker or become or work in the job. It, that's not that's what she said. Now, this will come an issue down the road. This is Betty Friedan right here. She passed away about a decade ago. It's a it's a really good book. I mean, that's one of those books where. Uh, yeah, I was really I know it be, I know it's good and I want to read it, but she's a, a incredibly talented author. We'll come back to this. There's also teen culture. Last thing for today. There's always been a generation gap, but there's never been a greater one in the 1950s because families had more affluence, more wealth, and that means kids have more app, um, more money. Not all, but more, they could buy more stuff. Well, let's be clear, there's always been a generation gap. You're at the age, you're starting to break away from your parents. It's, just, it's natural, you're breaking away. And that is pretty traumatic. It's traumatic for them, it's traumatic for you. Oh, and I should add, old people have always done this. Kids these days are not as tough as I. And you will too. You might have done that. These freshmen aren't as tough as we were. You probably said that, or you know someone who did. I've heard people do it, Junior. And yes, I, I hang around with, since I'm old, I hang around with old people, and they say that about you all. You're not tough. And yes, we said that about people when I was younger. We said older people said it. it's always happened. Old people. Oh yeah, and, and you guys think you're cool and think old people are dumb and, and 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 don't understand what's going on. And but we know more than you think. I heard about you. Okay. Oh, who has Bill? Oh, should we go? Last thing before you go, who likes Bill Cream? Bill Cream? Put the grease in your hair so your hair slipped back. Goodbye. We're coming to rock and roll music for the lobotomy one. So. But Bollywood began to be. And it is Yeah. John Kennedy's, I think, uh, second youngest. Yeah, so like, I was like, yep, on social media, picture. and there's just like pictures of her before she got the mask, and pictures of her after, and it was just awkward. She was just, just, um, just go through normal problems. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Funny. That's pretty clever. I like that. Um, I'm leaving for DECA this week. I'm going to be gone Friday. And it's just so good to get some good to see you. Good for you. Yeah. Where you guys going today? Orlando. In Orlando. Mm -hmm. It's not anything but it's also just happy. It's, it's a weird place, but there's also a lot of neat things too. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, there'll be a little bit of homework for the victims when you have to review the packet. Yeah. I'm going to sign a couple of things for you. Like, like, you just don't want to do And so I'll just check with you. Okay. I, I know you're going to. Yeah. Okay. Have, and remind me again, but have fun. Okay, thank you. How many people are going? I was clicking everybody. Oh, that's why. Stop recording.